So this station is all going to be about TCCC and um, self aid buddy care. Um, so first, I'm going to be doing a basic overview of TCCC and some basics into self aid buddy care, like uh, the ABCs and then shock. And then Lee's going to be do going into more about um, self aid buddy care, as in like what some more treatments you're going to be doing for common uh, injuries on the field. Then Hasty will be talking about nine line medevac, which is definitely pretty important because you got to get those people out there and get them um, to people who can actually treat them. Um, and then I'll be going back over TCCC and the, the main gist of the approach to how we're going to treat someone. Um, so does anyone know what TCCC stands for? I know it's pretty new, so it stands for Tactical Combat Casualty Care. Um, pretty new stuff, but uh, now you know. And then, does anyone know what the ABCs are? Um, A, B, C. A is airway. B okay. is breathing. C is circulation. All right, good stuff. Um, can y'all tell me why those things are important, 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 respectfully? So, for airway. Um, well, to make sure that they're, like, even alive still. Like, they're breathing. Mm-hmm, yeah. Oh, okay. Anyway. Breathing could, like, let you know if they have access to air, lungs, and if not, whether they're having a choking incident, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah circulation kind of the same thing. Make sure that they're conscious and like breathing. Yes. So for airway, um, I like to think of it as like physical. Like you come up on someone, can you see something physically impeding their ability to breathe and have an airway? Um, and then breathing is obviously like them actually being able to breathe through said airway. And then circulation, you know, that's going to be dealing with is the heart pumping blood to the body and are they bleeding? From any places on the body so does anyone know how we're going to treat perhaps something impeding someone's airway something lodged in someone's airway okay you got it you give it a shot so if they have like a like a shot or something or a bullet in their, in their body or something like that okay so uh, um yeah so lee's going to get into that more but what i what i meant was kind of up in like closer to the head area so one one thing we can do is push their chin up and back and so that's gonna help open up the airway. And then another way to do it is, so you can take your, your fingers and push their j bottom jaw forward, and that'll also help open up an airway. Um, and then so for breathing, what are some techniques that we can use to tell someone's breathing? All right, so you can follow like the Red Cross PCR procedures. You can check if they're breathing by like getting close to their face. I know that you have COVID, but nowadays you can like, or look for the rise and fall of their chest. Yeah. Feel their breath on your face. If they're not breathing, you can start, um, normally we don't use mouth to mouth. We have these like new mask things that you can start working with and you can like help them breathe and put air in their lungs if that's the case. Mm -hmm. And if it ends up being a circulation problem, you get a CPR. So yeah, exactly. So you, you went over the look, you can obviously tell if someone's breathing by if their chest is pumping um, or listen and, you know, get close to them and then feel, you can also stick your finger under their nose or something of that nature. Um, so one of the more common things we're also going to be dealing with is shock. So how can we tell if someone's in shock? You got it. Um, lack of response, looking dazed, uh, not able to process words together, or um, just sitting there in silence. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So how do we how do we treat that? Um, you treat that by talking to them, communicating with them, seeing what's wrong with them. If so there's a physical problem, you'll address that first. Um, but just continue to talk to them and provide, like, try to get them talking, talk about stuff they like with their family. Try to bring them back. Yeah, exactly. Like, calm them down. That's, that's you know, the gist of shock is people are freaking out or don't know what's going on. So you, you want to try to calm them down and bring them back to earth. Um, but, yeah, that's it for me for now. So I can go Yeah, ahead. so now I'm going to move into common injuries that TCCC would be helpful with, right? So this might be something that you encounter in a deployment whether that be overseas or it could even be, you know, like a TDY training exercise type thing, even stateside. Um, so pay attention. This is pretty important stuff. Um, so I'm going to kind of touch on the ABCs. So first thing, when you come up to a victim, you're going to want to assess them, go through those ABCs. And like Cadet Richmond mentioned, two ways that you're going to check that airway. So the head tilt and the chin lift. So you're going to tilt their head back and that's going to make their airway straight. And then you're going to uh, slightly pull that chin down just to open that airway. And so that's if they don't have a head or neck injury. If they do have a head or neck injury, you're gonna do what's called the jaw thrust and you're gonna hold their head kind of like this. You're gonna like cradle it so you don't move that head or neck region to not to uh, prevent any further damage. And then there's 
almost a pressure point, if you will, on the back of the jaw, where if you push with your thumbs, their jaw will open and therefore uh, their airway will open. So that kind of goes into head injury. So can anyone tell me a symptom of a head injury? Yeah. Um, symptoms of head injury could be like loss of vision, concussion, dizziness. Um, if it's broken, you could also be unable to move lower extremity. Yeah, definitely. And how to treat a head injury? Yeah. Yeah, so first you should uh, immobilize the head. So you should like, like as you said, you can use your, hand, your hands to immobilize it or like some wood or whatever you can use um, to like immobilize, immobilize the neck is the most important yeah. thing. Yeah, good. That's the biggest part. So then next we got second chest wound. So who can tell me some telltale signs of a second chest wound? Do you know Hernandez? Um, well, there would be an open wound and um, the blood be like, like oozing out of it. And yeah. And, like, Do you know like an important characteristic of the blood? Um, is it dark red or is it? Not quite. Yeah, yeah okay. It's bubbling or gurgling noises. Yeah, yeah, it's that red frothy blood that tells you that the air from your lungs is getting into that blood. And then also there's going to be like a hissing noise. You're going to be able to kind of hear it, you know, seeping out of their chest area. So then to treat that, you're going to want to um, put some sort, some sort of plastic on it and tape it on all four sides so that you can, you know, keep in that, uh, you know, contained air system. And then a big thing is you're going to want to flip over the victim and check for an exit wound, right? So if you have an entry wound, that's just as important in treating as an exit wound is. So you need to make sure to check for that um, to make sure that you have, you know, all the injuries accounted for. Um, what if there's no exit wound? Then you just have to leave the bullet be and... Um, and treat the entry wound. So that's a big point of TCCC is that we're not the medical professionals. Our job in TCCC is to be able to stabilize uh, this victim and get them to the medical professionals. Our job, our specialty is to be able to keep them alive for a few hours, a few minutes, however long it takes to get it into the hands of professionals. So then next we've got broken bones. So what might be a symptom of a broken bone? Is that Hernandez? Um, well, the actual limb could be like deformed or something. Yeah. Definitely. Like a bone. Right. Okay. What about maybe like a smaller fracture, maybe like a hairline fracture or something like that? Could it, Allison? So it could be struggling to walk or be experiencing pain or numbness. Yeah, and there might be bruising around the area too, right? So how would you treat a broken bone? Is that her name? Um, you'd make sure that whichever part is broken is like stable, as stable as it can be. So mm -hmm. there's no more movement to it that can make it worse. Yeah, it's good. So a big thing is you want to splint at the joint below and above it, right? So if my shin is broken, you would splint at my ankle and at my knee. And then, so what if my knee was broken? Where would you splint? Is that solid? Do the, the thigh and then the ankle. Yeah, yeah. So you'd want to come like all the way up to the hip. So then bleeding. Who knows the three types of bleeding? This is kind of a tough one. Yeah, Allison? Arterial bleeding, um, so usually that's like a big artery, you're going to be gushing blood, it's yep. going to be dark red. Um, then you can have, starts with a D, um, like your, I know this, well, I'll go to the capillary first. There so capillary go. bleeding is like, say you get like a skin burn, something, like it's still bleeding, it still mm -hmm. can be serious, especially if it's covering large areas of the body. So you still want to like, it's going to look like light red though, it's not going to really be gushing, it's just going to be there. And then the other one starts with a V, it's like Venous. 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 Venous yep. bleeding. And that one's more of a bright red. And it's not as gushing as much, but it's continuously gushing. Yeah. So actually the arterial bleed is going to be the bright red. And that's going to be the one that's like really pulsing out of the body. And that's where you can see, you know, like the actual heartbeat. And that's when you know it's a pretty serious bleed because uh, that blood is coming from a place close to the heart. And then the venous bleeding is going to be your dark red blood. That's a slow, a slow bleed. So that would be like, you know, a gash or like a bad cut, you know, that we've all probably had. Then your capillaries, your non-threatening, like paper cuts and stuff like that. So how would you treat uh, hemorrhaging, aka arterial bleeds? Yep. Um, stop the blood, like uh, put pressure on it. Yep. So, so that would be great for like a venous bleed and maybe some arterial bleeds. Um, but if, if it's a really bad arterial bleed, you're going to want to put a tourniquet. And so what they say is to put it high and tight. So if I'm bleeding really bad from like right above my elbow, you just want to put it all the way up to make sure that um, you make sure to cut off that blood flow. So the next we've got heat stroke and heat exhaustion. So this is a huge one at field training, right? South Alabama, just really hot, really humid. So who can tell me the difference between the two? Is that Salter? So heat stroke is when you have dry and hot skin at a very high overall body temperature, your pupils will be constricted. And heat exhaustion is when you have very moist and clammy skin 
you have a normal or subnormal body temperature and then your pupils will be dilated. Yeah, that's perfect. So obviously heat stroke is way worse, right? So if you need exhaustion, you wanna take them out of the sun and get them into the shade. You wanna make sure that you're trying to cool, cool them down, whether that be small sips of water, maybe a cool towel around their neck, you know, things of the like. And with heat stroke, that's way more serious. You probably wanna call 911. And at field training, they told us that if we got heat stroke, they'd put us in an ice bath. So that's a really dire situation. You need to lower your body temperature, you know, any way you can. So next we've got shock. Cadet Richmond already touched on that one. So next we've got an IED blast. So IED blast can kind of be, you know, hard to treat, right? Cause you might not know where to start. But a big thing is that you gotta remember the focus of TCCC, get them to the medical professionals. So if you can apply the proper tourniquets, make sure they're breathing and get them in the recovery position, chances are they're gonna be able to have a chance by the time they get to the medical professionals. So remember to focus on the skills you can do and don't try and outdo uh, your ability. So next we got abdominal wounds. So that's gonna be when your organs are, you know, spilling out of your side. So does anybody know how you would treat that? Yeah, Allison? Okay, so you don't wanna shove them back in because you don't know what you're doing. So instead what you're gonna do is you're gonna cover it typically with something sterile, plastic, and just keep that, try to keep it together without trying to push it back in. Then you're gonna secure that area with tape all around sides and you're gonna stabilize them usually. You don't wanna like move it to like where they're gonna have that injured side on the other side, you're gonna keep them first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you wanna cover it with like a damp towel just to make sure that you don't dry out those organs. And then a big thing is you do not wanna put them back in the body because there's gonna be a lot of foreign substances, if you will, that the body will just like, it'll just throw it way off. So last we've got an eye wound. So that is when you've got something obviously protruding out of your eye or it could just be loss of sight. So a big thing is you wanna make sure to stabilize the object if it's big enough to stabilize. And you wanna, so if I had a big stick sticking out of my eye, I'd you know wrap some gauze around the stick and then wrap it around my head to where that stick can't move. And then I would cover both eyes so that the injured eye doesn't move because our eyes move together, right? So if one eye moves, the other eye moves. So I wouldn't wanna cause further damage to the other eye by just having one eye move, right? All right, get that hasty, nine lines. All right, who can tell me what a nine line medevac is? All right, there's Hernandez. It's the, um, like the process you go through to tell the headquarters or to tell whoever the medical people are that there's some like severely injured people so they can get here and they can figure out how um, serious it is or not. That's perfect. Here, you all pass this around. I'm going to break it down for you line by line and give you an example of what a smooth nine line medevac needs to sound like. So first, line one, you've got your location at the pickup site. Be as specific as possible. The spot you're standing in right now, based on the grid square we're in, is 33.88, negative 83.35. At field training, you might have that opportunity to be that specific if you have a map. Um, if you don't have a map, we know Quintum's Phoenix is about 500 meters that way. Sun's setting in the west. We're about 500 meters northwest of Quintum's Phoenix. Uh, very important. They know where to get to you. Line two, radio frequency and call sign. For this example, if I'm in a team, I could be called Viper 1. And then for the frequency on your radio, whatever it is, if you've got a little walkie or a little handheld radio and you're talking on channel three, you'd say Viper 1, channel three. So very simple. Uh, line three, number of casualties by precedence. So these are all broken up, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, etc. cetera. Um, alpha and Bravo, urgent and urgent surgical. These need to be treated within two hours. This is something like extreme brain injury. That would be Alpha, that's urgent. Um, a gunshot wound, that's urgent surgical. They need to get treated, they need surgery, they need a doctor. Um, priority, that's gonna be within four hours. That's something like Cadet Lee talks about, a compound fracture. You've got a bone sticking out of a leg. That needs to be dealt with quickly. And then routine and convenience, those are much more common injuries. Um, Still, they need to be treated, so make sure you call those in as well. Uh, line four, special equipment needed. Those are pretty self-explanatory. You've got to hoist, lift people up. Extraction equipment. If somebody's stuck in a car, Jaws of Life can pry that apart. Um, Delta is a ventilator. If you went through your ABCs, they're not breathing. They need assistance. Call that in as well. And then line five, number of patients by type. Who can tell me what a litter is? The Ellison. The litter is like a, a group or someone who is unable to walk, so you need something to carry them. That's perfect, yeah. So the litter is gonna be that stretcher. They're gonna carry them on that stretcher. And then ambulatory, what does that mean? It does not mean ambulance. I've made that mistake. Good, Allison. The ambulatory means they can walk or that's, they can get themselves there. That's perfect, exactly. They can walk, somebody can assist them in walking. So after line five, you're gonna stop. That's the most crucial information that BDOC needs to know. After that fifth line, they can go ahead and start sending people. And then you're gonna double check, make sure your radio call is going in clearly. Move on to line six, security of the pickup site. 
those are pretty self-explanatory. If there are people still shooting at you, you don't want your helicopters to be shot down by rockets. You don't need your convoys getting blown up to save your people. Line seven, method of marking the pickup site. Use what you have. If you have a mirror and you can get creative, use that. If you have a smoke grenade, use that as well. Um, line eight, casualty nationality and status. Let them know who they're gonna be treating when they get there. And then line nine is NBC. Can y'all tell me what those stand for? Fernando? Uh, nuclear biological That's perfect, yeah. So if that's not available, you'll say none. And then if you want to, you can continue to describe the terrain more specifically so they know where you are. Um, are there any questions about any of those lines before I give an example? All right, awesome. So biggest thing, write it down before you call it in. A radio is push to talk, not push to think. You don't want to be taking up that airspace. People need help. It's very important that you do it quickly and B-Doc will get pissed off at you if you don't do it quickly. So, all right. Viper 1 to B-Doc, I'll copy. Uh, Viper 1, this is B-Doc. You copy? Uh, B-Doc, prepare for 9-line medevac. Viper 1, this is B-Doc. Ready for medevac. Line 1, 33.88. 3, Negative 83.35. Line 2, Viper 1, channel 3. Line 3, 2 Alpha, 3 Bravo, 1 Charlie. Line 4, Delta. Line 5, 5 Alpha, 1 Bravo. I'll copy my first 5, over. 5 for 1, good copy, continue with medevac online. Line, line 6, X-Ray. Line 7, Charlie. Line 8, 6 Alpha. Line 9, none. I'll copy my 9 line, over. 5 for 1, this is BDOT, good copy on 9 line, troops on the way. And then it's as simple as that. Write it down, make it smooth, help will come. Do you all have any questions? Um, so do you have to say break in between them, or can you just say the lines? Um, so if you're just going through lines, they're prepared for the lines. You do not have to say break in between the lines. Um, in the descriptions on your nine line, on a few of them, if you're going between, that's something I could have done between like five alpha, one bravo, you can say break in between. When I did it at field training, it wasn't always necessary. So depending on the situation. Any more questions? Okay, Richard. Alright, so last time I'm going to be going over like the main gist of PCCC, which again is security then treatment. We've, we've already done a pretty good job of, of going over what it is. Um, so firstly, it's care under fire. So if Cadet Hasty is downed in the battlefield and he needs to be helped, I can't do that until I secure the area. So I need to secure the area first and then I can initiate care um, to, you know, help him out. Um, or, you know, we can maybe get Cadet Hasty out of the out of the dangerous area and then treat him. You don't want to treat someone in an area that's lit up with uh, gunfire or anything like that. Um, and then, so next we're gonna be going into tactical field care, which is actually doing all the things that Cadet Lee talked about and some of what I talk, um, talked about. Um, but also, you must remember, like don't do stuff you don't know how to do. Do what you know how to do, but don't do things that are out of your area of expertise. That's for the doctors that are gonna help them once we can get the um, nine line uh, medevac to come in. And then so tactical evaluation care is whenever we're actually calling in that nine line. And then, you know, we need to prepare, you know, if it was Cadet Hasty, I need to make sure that he's ready to go um, and do as much as I can to help him um, be able to get on that evac, uh, evac and um, make that transition as smooth as possible. Um, also, a big thing is just thinking on your feet. You're all pretty smart. You're at the University of Georgia. Just be smart in what you do and be creative in how you're gonna help someone. But again, don't do something that you shouldn't be doing. So yeah, that's it.